Good afternoon all. My name is Tabitha Binding and I'm Head of Education for Timber Development UK and we'd like to welcome you to TD UK's webinar series on engineering with timber. This series aims to aid your engineering education so that as we transition to a bio-based economy, you have the tools and knowledge to include timber within the projects you work on, whether new builds or retrofit. Webinar three is on designing timber columns, which sounds straightforward, but as you will find out today, it isn't. Timber Development UK has been formed from the merger of two of the largest and longest established organisations in the supply chain. That's the Timber Trade Federation and the Timber Research and Development Association, probably better known as TRADA. We came together to connect the supply chain, to lead best practice and accelerate towards a low carbon future. Today's webinar will focus on the process of designing timber columns, the vertical supports of a building. We, they, um, our speakers will look at buckling and bearing with hands-on practical approach, and we'll then go through some simple calculations. The lecture will contain technical content, but will also provide shortcuts and links to tables for those from a non-engineering background. Um, and as you keep all coming into the room, this is Zoom meetings. Um, very welcome to keep your cameras on. Um, please stay muted. Um, and if you have questions, we've got the, que the we've got the chat function open. So please pop your questions in there. Our speakers today are James Norman from Bristol University and Vicky Edmondson from Northumbria University. And I'm going to hand over to them now. Thank you for joining us today and speaking. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Tabitha. So I'm going to share my screen. Um, so hopefully everyone can see my slides. Are they, they appeared? Yep. Great. Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, oh, I've already realized that I've left last last session's date on the screen. I'm so sorry. Um, so just to say, I'm probably going to make a number of mistakes. Um, so um, me and Vicky are doing a bit of a double act, but I'll be doing most of the talking and Vicky will then be um, asking questions, interrupting and correcting uh, any errors that I make uh, and, and making sure that I stay honest and, and explain things properly and thoroughly. So that's that's kind of the the um, order of the, the afternoon. Um, Vicky, I don't know if you wanted to really quickly just introduce yourself and then I'll, I will take back over and carry on. Uh, yeah, I just introduced myself. So I'm Vicky Edmondson. I am Associate Prof at uh, Northumbria University. have been working with timber for about eight or nine years. Um, own a couple of timber properties and um, believe that this is obviously the way forward for the future. Fantastic. Thanks, Vicky. Um, so today we're going to be talking about timber columns and, and studs and anything in, in compression where you have to design for axial buckling. Uh, and that's going to be the main focus of our, our session. Um, just really quickly introduce myself. So I am James. I work for the University of Bristol. I used to work uh, for Rambol and for Integral Engineering Design. And I'm going to show you a couple of projects in a minute, which I did one with each. Um, I also authored Structural Timber Elements, uh, designing timber structures and I led the conceptual design of buildings uh, team and so I've done kind of a lot of work in the trying to share information uh, around um, timber design and, and especially uh, conceptual design of buildings one of the things I tried to do was was put timber in that book in a, on a level playing field with steel and concrete and other materials so that um, as engineers, we we kind of when we're choosing materials, we we're including timber in our consideration right from the offset. Um, so we're talking today about um, columns and, and walls, stud walls. And I just thought I'd quickly show you a couple of projects I worked on before becoming a full time academic. The first one, Springfield, um, was a mix of reuse and uh, new build. So the, the the building highlighted in red, that was an existing sports centre, and we reused a, a number of the spaces, although we did quite a lot of alteration works. The building highlighted in blue, this is a brand new timber frame CLT building. It was a mixture of a library, uh, office space, and then um, community spaces. 
And then the bit highlighted in lilac uh, is um, uh, a linking building, which has got things like a climbing wall in, changing room facilities for the external uh, spaces. And um, this is a, a fairly interesting building in that it utilizes both steel and timber. And actually we, on the project, we use the same sub contractor to supply both the steel and, and the timber, which worked really well. Um, this is the building and being constructed. So you can see here, we've got two um, separate frames, the steel frame and timber frame. So the movement joints between them because steel and timber move quite differently. Um, and you can start to see some columns. We've got walls. So this had low bearing walls. It had columns in it. It's um, made from a mixture of CLT, which are the big walls uh, and, and glue lamb columns. And the glue lamb columns came in different flavors. So we had rectangular glue lamb columns. We also had circular glue lamb columns. Um, and so we had a variety of different material or st structural column forms in the project. Uh, here you can see just some simple details, beams coming into columns. We're going to talk in a little bit about when designing columns, the fact that you need to think carefully about um, load and where the load comes from and the eccentricity that that load creates in the moment that you get as a result. Uh, and so, yeah, they're just kind of highlighting a few different bits and bobs. Here we have a, a long span roof with a, a lightweight timber steel truss um, that creates this big open space. Um, the second project I just wanted to highlight was Staunton Primary School. Uh, I worked on this one only up to kind of stage two. So we just did the initial concept design. It's only a single story building and it is made up of mix. So we've got um, glue lamb frame with columns around the wall space. And then um, we've got uh, the majority of the classrooms, corridors, circulation space is made up of what was intended to be timber cassette panels. So kind of prefabricated panels, which were brought onto site, uh, ready, uh, fabricated and just put into position uh, with I-beam joists to create a roof. But actually on that project, the contractor preferred to do it all on site. So they actually brought everything in, in pieces and constructed it all on site. Uh, the stud walls are providing the vertical support to the roof and also providing the lateral stability. Um, we're not going to cover the lateral stability side and racking panels and sheathing board and all of that sort of stuff uh, today. We're just going to keep it nice and simple and go through some of the basics of designing for axial load. And we're also going to reference back to some of the content from Gavin last week and designing for bending. Uh, so this is what the project looked like when it was finished. And I just like this photo because it's snowy and it kind of looks pretty. Um, but this is this is kind of um, how the project ended up. So as I mentioned earlier, um, last week you had a session with Gavin. Gavin covered design for bending. He did a phenomenal job. I've been through his slides and he gave you loads and loads and loads of information. What I will try and avoid doing is replicating that information. So I don't want to repeat what he said. But I think it's just useful to have a quick reminder of what was covered. Um, so he talked about uh, the fact that we're designing to Eurocode, uh, that the Eurocode is a limit state design. It uses the ultimate limit state, and that, that will be important when we come to buckling and understanding why we pick some of the values we do, um, that we need to check for deflection and vibration for beams and also for, for columns sometimes. Um, and that we can't just get away with just doing an ultimate limit state check that often it's the deflection that governs the design. So that was last week. Uh, last week, Gavin, Gavin covered flexure, which we're going to come back over today. Uh, deflection, uh, oh, I've spelled that wrong. That's another mistake. I'm so sorry. Uh, bearing uh, and lateral torsional buckling or LTB. So you have already touched on buckling in timber, but we'll, we'll go back through it probably a bit more slowly than last week. Um, Gavin talked to you about characteristic values, so where to get them from. Uh, he talked about K-mod, K-H, K-sys, K-crit, and K-def, which are all modification factors. K-mod modifies for um, service class, which is how humid, wet the, the timber is, and load duration. K-h modifies for the depth of the timber, the size of the timber. K-sys modifies for whether uh, the timber is working on it on its own in isolation or whether it's got multiple timbers working together, uh, which can share the load if, if one is less stiff than the other. K-crit is for lateral torsional buckling and K-def is for deflection and accounting for long-term deflection and creep. Uh, so we'll we'll kind of use some of those again this week. But what I won't be doing is going into the detail about how to derive them and where they come from. So we'll we'll kind of cover those quite quickly. So do go back over last week's video if you want to pick up 
on any of that. Uh, last week, he covered E-Mean, uh, which is Young's modulus, and Gamma M. I couldn't find uh, the Gamma symbol, so I just typed it in, which is the partial safety factor for the material. So all of that's been covered. So this week, we're going to be adding stuff. So we're going to be talking about design of columns and studs. Uh, we're going to pick up a little bit on the similarities and the differences. We're going to um, do a quick bit on calculating the axial uh, load and moment when designing a stud wall. We're going to do uh, the buckling check and go through the four-step process. We're going to do combined bending and buckling check. Uh, and I've put bearing check in brackets. We're not going to go back over the bearing check, but we are going to remind ourselves why actually the size of our vertical elements, the columns or, or studs, may actually not be governed by the loads that we just spent this week going through, but actually may be governed by the beam design and, and the bearing interface between the beam and the column or stud. So that's all that we're planning to do. So I've got a couple more slides and then I'm kind of excited. I'm going to be jumping across to my visualizer and doing some live live calculations, which is where I'm almost certainly going to get things wrong. So comparing columns and studs, what are, what are we doing? What are we thinking about? What are the differences? What are we looking for? So a column is essentially a single element which is supporting a series of beams uh, and or slabs. Um, it's it's generally free to buckle in both directions, which is kind of the big deal. And in a minute, I'm going to do a little live demo of what I mean by that. So it can buckle around its major axis and it can buckle around its minor axis. Uh, a stud wall, on the other hand, is actually made up of lots of timbers. Uh, and those timbers are generally spaced at a sensible spacing, uh, ideally 600 centers, um, because that's the size of the, the kind of a good size for a boarding to make sure that you don't have to cut boarding and throw material away. Um, but we'll talk a bit more about that. Um, but the way that the studs work is because they've got boarding on the two faces, on the front face and back face, they're, they're, they're restrained around their minor axis. So I'm going to, this is, this is going to, let's see if I can draw uh with my pen this is gonna so for the column it's much more likely to buckle in this direction around its minor axis so bending around the zz axis it's much more likely to buckle in that direction for my stud it can't buckle in that direction because the sheathing board is preventing buckling assuming i've uh, designed it properly and got enough fixings between my boarding and my stud so actually it's going to buckle around a major axis only which actually is going to really help because it gives us a, a, a greater capacity the other difference will come in terms of thinking about the effective length uh, and we'll cover that in more detail in a minute so i'm going to jump to my next slide and at this point i'm going to switch to my visualizer so i am going to hopefully turn this on and I am hopefully going to stop sharing my slides. And I'm hoping that someone is going to spotlight me so that my uh, my screen becomes by far the biggest. There we go, winner. OK, so we talked about buckling a little bit. And I've actually got uh, on my desk, uh, I don't know if you guys have come across this, uh, but a molar, a molar kit. I'm a big fan of molar kits. They're, they're beautiful things. And I've just taken out of my molar kit um, a simple a simple column, and I'm just going to disconnect uh, disconnect the ends. These are moment connection, so they're they're, they're brackets, and we're going to have a simple column. And today, what we're really thinking about, if all goes to plan, is when I apply load, it's going to okay. Let's try and encourage it to buckle, so you can see the buckle. We're thinking about buckling. OK, now when a column buckles, um, it typically is pinned top and bottom, at least in timber design. And so we expect to see this kind of buckled shape. Uh, and what we find is that as we uh, create fixity, so I'm going to fix it at one end and not at the other, it changes the effective length. I'm hoping for all of you, this is this is kind of 101 that you've kind of done this loads of times, but uh, I'm aware that there's a very broad uh, range in the audience. So this time, let's keep trying to buckle in and out the page. Let's, let's uh, just discourage that by trying to put one of these. So this time when it buckles, you, you see I've got a bit of fixity. So it's, it's changed the buckled shape and um, we get different buckled shapes depending on what's going on. And so hopefully 
when we move on to our design in a minute, we can refer back to this and think about the different buckle shapes and different effective lengths that we're designing for. So that's buckling. That's buckling a column. The difference between a column and a stud is that uh, with studs, there's not one column. There's lots of vertical elements in a line and all of them are taking the load. So they're all working together. When they buckle, they can't buckle sideways because the sheathing board is presenting them. So they can only buckle in and out the plane of the, of the boarding. Okay, so that takes me to my example. So what I want to do is, is I'm gonna go through the theory, but uh, by going through an example. Um, so I'm gonna design a wall. And so I'm gonna give us some information about this wall. So it's got a, a, a vertical load of 34 kilonewtons per meter. Um, and that is total factored load. So that's ULS with load factors applied. Um, so I'm gonna design my wall. My wall is gonna, let's just quickly try and draw, draw it. So it's a series of studs. And I'm gonna make some decisions and you're gonna say, how did you make those decisions? And I'm going to give you one of those really annoying answers, which is, well, I just use my experience and the fact I've done this lots of times before. Um, but the reality is um, that I have used a combination of experience and also uh, structural timber elements, um, which has a series of lookup tables. And so for columns, for example, I can look at what is the capacity for different size columns with different grades of timber at different lengths. Um, and I can look at uh, walls and I can find out what the capacity of walls is, both under vertical loading, but also under wind loading. And hopefully that will help me choose the right one. And so I'm going to tell you now uh, that I'm going to choose a 150 by 47 C16 stud. And that my spacing is going to be uh, 600 millimeters between them. As I said before, we ideally want something that is a ratio of kind of uh, fits into a 2.4 by 4.8 uh, panel. So if you imagine this is uh, plywood or OSB, those typically come in 2.4 by 4.8 panels. And so I want something that will split into that. So it could have been uh, 400 or it could have been 300. If I use other things, uh, then I, um, I'm i going to have to start cutting the, the boarding to, and creating waste. So I'm going to stick with my 600, which is a good good number. That, that's the, the preferred number. So the first thing I need to know is, okay, so I know what the load is uh, on my wall per meter. So what is my load on an individual stud? So the load on my individual stud and add is equal to 34 times the spacing, which I've just told you is 600. And that gives me my load per stud, which is 20.4 kilonewtons a stud. So that's the load that I'm gonna be designing for. Um, if you've done lots of steel design, then, then you're gonna notice that these numbers are very, very small compared to what you might be used to designing for um, steel columns and things like that. And, and that is the case that timber is a very different material. It works in a different like, way. It works well in different circumstances. Um, so this is ideal for stud wall for two, three, four story building. Um, so I've got my load. I know that I'm designing a stud. I know the size of the stud. And uh, there's a few other things that I need to think about. Firstly, I need to think about how is the load being applied to my stud wall? So let's just quickly draw a detail. So this is my timber, my timber beam, and then I'm gonna have a wall plate, and then my stud, and I'm gonna have some boarding that sits. Now I've decided that the load is all coming from one side, and I've done that on purpose. And the reason I've done that is because I want to talk to you a little bit about eccentricity of load. So in, in a steel or concrete design, I might assume the load is acting in the middle of my stud, and then I might add a, a nominal 20 mil uh, moment uh, or eccentricity to create a moment. Here in timber design, I'm going to assume a triangular load distribution. So I'm not going to assume that everything is plastic and that the load is going to be distributed equally across the width of the stud. Instead, I'm going to assume that the load is going to be distributed mostly at this corner and it's going to reduce to zero at the back which means that the load uh, is acting at one third of the way in of my stud. So that's 50 mil in, because it's a 150 stud. 
So I've got 50 mil in, and the center line of my stud, it's a 150 stud, is 75 mil. So that gives me an eccentricity of 25 millimeters. Okay. Um, so I've got an eccentricity of 25 millimeters. So as well as having an axial load, I'm also going to have a design moment, uh, MED, which is my axial load multiplied by my eccentricity, uh, which is in meters, because I want the answer in kilonewton meters, not kilonewton millimeters. So I get 20.4 times 0 0.025. And this gives me a value, hopefully, of 0 0.51 kilonewton meters on each stud. Okay, so I've now set up the problem. I'm designing a stud wall. I've got studs at 600 centers. I know what the axial load is on each stud, and I know what my design moment is on each stud. So now I'm going to try and go through the design process and prove that my 150 by 47 C16 stud is accurate, uh, is the right size. Just for complete clarity, uh, the 150 is the this dimension here. 47 is this dimension here. C16, that's the grade of timber. And in fact, let's just remind ourselves uh, of where that came from. So you really should be taking that from BSEM 338 2016, but um, you can also look it up in other places. So for example, uh, in my introduction to designing timber structures, there is a whole table with some of the more gen general values that you might use on a regular basis. As I said, these come from BSEN 338-2016, and I would recommend going back to that document. I, I always think it's best to go back to the British Standard. Uh, but for now, let's just quickly remind ourselves of three very important things. So I'm referring to BSEN 338, and I'm using table one, I think. And so I've got my FM y k so this is the bending capacity and it's a c16 timber and 16 is the the the, the characteristic bending uh, capacity strength uh, which is 16 newtons a millimeter squared so that 16 is that 16 now then if you're designing in steel and concrete you're like uh yeah so 16 is the number i need in timber not the case every every different axis and every different uh, type of load has a different value so the axial value, so FC compression uh, parallel to the grain, that's the zero characteristic value is 17 newtons a millimeter squared. So this is the axial capacity, uh, the, the strength of my timber, uh, and it's different, you'll notice. The other thing I'm going to need is the Young's modulus, and you'll see why in a minute. Um, and this is the value. The zero means it's parallel to the grain. The zero five means this is now the characteristic value. So last week you used the Young's modulus um, and you used the mean value to calculate deflection. This week we're going to be using this not to do a deflection check, but to do a buckling check. Buckling is ultimate limit state. And because it's ultimate limit state, we use the characteristic value, which means we need the uh, five percentile value of the Young's modulus. OK, so these are going to be very, very key as we go through the design process. I'm just going to double check. So I think I'm halfway through and I've got 20 minutes left, which is a win. OK, so everything I do is going to be based on uh, BSEN1995. Um, it's the most recent version, uh, but I won't write out the full thing. 6.3.2. That is, covers design for axial load. Um, BSEN 1995, 6.3.2 gives you loads of equations. It's fairly dense and hard to follow. So what I'm going to try and do is deconstruct some of that, give you some of the information that you need, explain what some of these terms are as we go through. So the first thing you need to do is calculate lambda. Lambda stands for the slenderness, and it's the relative slenderness and as I said earlier on, we're only considering the major axis because it's a stud wall and the sheathing ball prevents it buckling in the minor axis. So I'm only going to do the major axis. I'm going to calculate the slenderness divided by pi, multiplied by FC 0k over E. 
okay. So this is the equation that's given to you in the code. What the code doesn't tell you is what lambda y is. I mean, it does tell you, but it just gives it a written description. So what we need to do is work out what lambda y is. And lambda y is the slenderness, as you will have discovered it in things like steel design. Uh, so we're going from the slenderness to the relative slenderness or kind of the non-dimensional slenderness. Um, and it's just the effective length divided by this thing is the radius of gyration, which is the square root of the second moment of area divided by the area. OK, so we, we we need to know the effective length, the second moment of area, the area of the section. We need to know FC 0K. We already know that. We need to know E005. We already know that. And this is just pi uh, 3.14. Or, you know, you might want to quote it to more decimal points if you really want to. Uh, I wouldn't bother. This is not that precise. So you really don't need it to that level. OK, so quick reminder. Uh, let's do the easy ones. So IY, the second moment of area, is BD cubed over 12, which is equal to 47, that's the breadth of my section, times 150 to the power of 3 over 12, which is equal to 1321 centimetres to the 4. And I write it in centimetres to the 4 because I grew up designing everything in steel, and so I auto-convert everything uh, into CM to the 4 when doing second moments of area. Oh, apologies for the laughter in the background, not sure how much you can hear that. Um, the area is 47 times 150, which is equal to 7050 millimeters squared. OK, so hopefully so far so good. And then the effective length. And we discussed that earlier and I did that demo and I here we go. I've still got it here. I've still got it here. Um, there are probably two cases that we really need to know about as timber engineers. One is the pin pin case. So that's the case where uh, you've got a column, it's pinned at each end, and it's going to buckle top to bottom. I'm assuming that the top and bottom are held in position. So essentially, there is some kind of bracing system. Otherwise, the effective length starts getting a lot longer. Uh, so my LE is equal to 1.0 times the actual length. So if I'm designing a column, I'm probably using this one. If I'm designing a stud wall, it's a little bit more complicated. So um it isn't fully fixed so if it were fully fixed which was the case i showed you again with, with my i might get a buckled length that looks like this and i would take it as 0.7 l the reality is in a stud wall the way it's constructed with the sheathing board and the wall plate and the sole plate and the way you connect it to the slab there is some degree of fixity it's not fully fixed but it's also not fully pinned and so what we often do is we treat it as if it's partially fixed. So I'm going to do a rubbish job of drawing this, but essentially we're imagining that there is a, pit, a spring at each end, which allows it not to fully rotate like a pin, but also it doesn't lock it fully in place. So the buckled length kind of is, I've drawn it badly, but ends up being somewhere between 1 and 0 0.7. And so we treat it as 0 0.85 times the actual length. Now, I have done a bad job of explaining to you what the actual length is. I was just going to set it and I've decided this is quite a tall space. Sorry, I should have told you this earlier. I knew I was going to forget something. So I'm going to assume that my 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 building is a four meter clear height uh, between the ground floor and the first floor. So my effective length is going to be uh, is equal to four meters multiplied by 0 0.85, which is going to give me a value of 3,000. A question in the chat, um, James, which might Great. be appropriate to answer at this stage. Uh, Feng Liu has asked, relating to the 5% percentile strength properties, yes. lateral torsional buckling, ultimate limit state calculation, you need G0.05, but this isn't given in the Eurocode. How do you calculate and find its value? Uh, pass. Um that's a great question. Trying to get any sort of data that isn't published is really, really hard. We're actually writing a book uh, on probabilistic base design, and we tried to back calculate all of the sort of mean and characteristic values for timber, and it's really hard to do. So uh, in that case, I imagine the expectation is you would use the mean value, even though in theory the characteristic value would be slightly lower. Um, that's not a very... Uh, full answer and I apologize but I imagine uh, the the code committee has decided that it's close enough 
and that's why they haven't differentiated. Um, the E uh, mean and E uh, characteristic value are quite different and it does have quite a big impact on the design. So that's why we're using those. Uh, that's a really woolly answer. I, I wish I could give you a more precise answer, but I, I hope that's at least lets you know that you're not, you know, kind of looking in the right direction. It's a good question to ask, but I don't know if the answer is going to be very easy to find out. Is is that okay, Vicky? I think that's uh, uh, an answer that I would have given, and it's got a. Doesn't seem to be any further questions in the chat, but I will let you know if any appear. Great, thank you so much. Okay, so we we've now worked out that we know the effective length, the i y, the a, so we can calculate lambda y. So lambda y is equal to seventy eight point five. Once I know lambda y, uh, I can then see I know lambda y, I know pi, I know fc 0k and e005. So therefore, I can calculate my lambda rel y. And I'm just going to give you the number because uh, I've already prepped this. So I already know the answer. Um, if I was doing this in a lecture, I'd have probably calculated the answer myself and encourage you to do the same and check that what I've got is right. Because I, as I said, I do make a fair few mistakes. Uh, some of my old students are actually here, so they can verify that I regularly make mistakes in lectures. Um, so that's step one. Step one is, the, uh, is a long one and it takes a while to describe you. I'm thinking, oh my goodness, there's only 10 minutes left. How are we going to get through this? The rest of it is going to be a lot quicker. Step two is by far the quickest step. And that is... Uh, accounting for um, the degree of um, what's the, right, the lack of tolerance, the kind of the straightness or lack of straightness. And for different materials, it's different. So for solid timber, uh, the euro code gives us a value of 0 0.2. Uh, if I was using glue lamb or LVL, I would use a value of 0 0.1. OK, simple as that. Right. Step two is done. Step three. I'm going to. I'll tell you what, let me move on to the next page. Step three is, is, is a calculator crusher, but it's not actually very difficult. We're going to be using the Perry Robertson approach. So just as a little factoid, Andrew Robertson, who came up with the Perry Robertson formula, uh, was a professor at the University of Bristol. Uh, I didn't actually know that for many years that he came up with this approach I, and I've been using it. But I discovered it one day and was very excited to find out where it came from. So step three requires us to uh, calculate K, C, Y. All we're doing now is trying to work out uh, the reduction factor. And it is a long, a long and big formula, which we're just going to put our numbers in. So we've got KY uh, plus square root of KY squared minus lambda rel Y squared okay so that's equation one i don't know yet what ky is so ky is given as 0 0.5 times one plus beta c that was the value i just calculated times by lambda rel y that was what i calculated in the step one minus 0 0.3 plus lambda rel y squared okay so before I give you the answer, just to say, if lambda rel is less than or equal to 0 0.3, there is it is not going to buckle. It's a short, stocky column, and you don't need to worry about buckling. It's going to fail in axial compression. If lambda rel y is greater than 0 0.3, then it is going to buckle, and you need to reduce the uh, axial capacity to account for the buckling. This is exactly the same process as it is in the steel design. The euro code doesn't in the timber euro code doesn't put it out in these steps in quite the same way, but I think it's a useful way of just structuring your approach. So I'm going to calculate ky, which is equal to 1.6. Where did I get 1.6 from? I literally just put in bc lambda rel y, which I calculated previously, uh, and lambda rel y squared. I then put ky and lambda rel y into the second equation, and I get a value of 0.42. Now then, if you like to be precise, uh, those equations are by far the best way of doing things. However, I always recommend to my students not to use the equations because you are very likely to make errors and mistakes and to get it wrong. And so there is another approach 
which is to create a table of all the values of KCY based on Lambda Rel. And I have done exactly that. So that's the lateral torsional buckling one. Apologies. Let's go back. Uh, so here we go. So for beta C of 0 0.2, okay, Lambda Rel, we had a Lambda Rel value of 1.4. Read up, read across. We end up with about 0 0.4 something. We get 0 0.42. So this is much less likely to lead to a mistake. It's not as accurate but it's much less likely to lead to a mistake than trying to put it through those equations. At least use a lookup chart to check to make sure you've not made a mistake because mistakes here can be very, very costly, not just financially, but in terms of safety. Okay, so that's step three done. Step four is to then check the allowable, the, the design stress against the allowable stress. So the stress in my strut is going to be equal to the axial load that I calculated all the way back at the beginning, 20.4. It's times 10 to the 3 because it's in kilonewtons. And I'm going to divide it by the area of my section, 150 times 47, which is going to give me 2.9 newtons a millimeter squared. Great. OK. The second half of step four is to compare that to uh, my axial compression capacity multiplied by this reduction factor that I've just calculated. So I need to make sure that is less than, uh, so the stress in my section is less than the capacity, which is equal to FC multiplied by KC phi. Okay, what is this thing here? Well, this is just the axial capacity and it's the design value, not the characteristic value. You did this last week for bending. So I'm just going to do it really quickly here. So I'm multiplying it by the K mod value and the K cis value. And I'm dividing it by gamma M. I'm doing it quickly because it's exactly the same as for bending. Uh, so this value is one point, uh, sorry, 17. We looked that up right at the beginning. I'm assuming it's a medium turn loading service class two, uh, sorry, service class one. So I'm going to use a K mod value of 0.8. And K cis is gonna, I'm gonna take a value of 1.1 because I've got lots of studs in a line. If one is slightly uh, less stiff than all the others, then the others will, will come in and share the load. So it's possible for the load to be shared. And as a result, I can use this 1.1 value. My partial safety factor, material factor is 1.3. That again was covered last week. So you just need to look it up. So all of those things, all of those values are taken from table 3.1 for K-mod, 6.6 .6 for K-sys, and table 2.3 for Gamma-M. So you can look up all of those values in Eurocode 5. That's going to give me a value of 11.5. Um, so my design strength is 11.5. My Kit reduction is 0.42. So let's do 11.5 times by 0.42 is 4.9 newtons a millimeter squared. My stress is 2.9. So therefore, 2.9 is less than the 4.9. So therefore, my design is okay. Now, it's okay, but it's not working very hard. That's because we still haven't thought about the bending check. Okay, I'm just aware of time. I've got five minutes. We can do a bending check in five minutes. So we're still, we are still in 6.3.2 of the code. We haven't moved away from there. All of this is all in that one bit of the code. Okay, and we're going to do a bending check. So for a bending check, we are going to do Okay, so this is the, the stress in the section due to axial load divided by the capacity, accounting for the reduction due to buckling, plus the stress in the section due to bending divided by the strength of the, the design strength of the, the timber. And we've got a, a third term, which we're going to ignore because it's the minor axis bending term, which we don't have. And there's actually two forms of this equation. 
in one km is next to this value and in the other km is next to this value. But because this is zero, we don't need to worry about km. So we're just going to look at the axial capacity and the ratio of moment capacity. And we're going to make sure that they are less than or equal to one. OK, so what is the bending stress? Again, this is just revision from last week. So we take that moment that we worked out right back at the beginning. So my moment is uh, 0.51 kilonewton meters per stud. So I've got 0.51. And I'm dividing it by um, the elastic modulus, which in my case is 47 times 150 squared over six. And I should have given you it as an equation first. Uh, so uh, my moment divided by my elastic modulus is equal to 2.9 newtons a millimetre squared. Very good. F, M, Y, D. So that's equal to uh, F, M, Y, K. So this is the bending strength now. Multiplied by K mod. Multiplied by K cis. Over gamma M. So that is equal to 16, not 17, 16. Uh, because it's the bending stress, not the compression stress, multiplied by 0 0.8, my K mod, multiplied by 1.1, divided by 1.3, which gives me a value of 10.8 newtons a millimeter squared. So then this is the big moment. Have I have I managed to come up with a, a design that works? So my stress due to actual load, 2.9, the reduction factor 0 0.42 times by the axial strength, 11.5, plus the stress due to bending, which is oh, kind of nicely the same, divided by my bending capacity, or bending strength, 10.83, which is equal to 0 0.86, which is less than or equal to one. Hooray! Design works. We are happy. Now, you might go, oh my goodness, uh, that's way short of one. Shouldn't you be designing to a full utilization of one? And I would say, yeah, A, yes, I completely agree. But actually, within the standard sizes of timber, if we reduce it from a 150 to a smaller section, it will definitely fail. And I think the next size down from a 47 uh, also probably will fail. So this is probably the first most efficient section for this particular configuration, even though it's not at 100% capacity. Um, so I'm going to stop sharing my camera. And oh, I didn't mean to do that. I'm going to just turn back on. So here we go. This is me. I've been here the whole time. And I'm going to share my slides again. Um, just a minute. Apologies. Oh, here we go. Yep. OK, so I've been through all of that. I think I'm doing OK for time. I've got one minute left. Uh, so that was if my in case, my live buckling demonstration didn't work. So just to finish, just to finish, connections bearing and why the column isn't sized yet or the stud wall isn't sized yet. There are lots of different ways we can connect vertical elements, columns and studs to both the slab, the ground floor slab and to other timber members. And all of them have impact and a lot of them actually might change the size of the section. So, for example, um, is it still in drawing mode? I think so. So here, what we might find is although the stud works, we might actually find the bearing capacity of the timber uh, in the beam doesn't work, and we might have to increase the stud size to make that work. Uh, for example, at this end, we've got a big moment connection, and so the moment design may become much more important and may size the the both the the the, the column and the beam, and we might be much more interested in things like stiffness, not just um, strength. So we might be thinking about deflection, deflection limits, how stiff the connection is all of that sort of thing. So it's not to say you don't need to design the stud, you really, really do. It's just the design needs to consider the connection type as well. And then you need to go through that whole process. And unfortunately, we were discussing this in the warm up to the webinar. It's not like there's a, oh, it's always this. And if you just do X and Y, then it will always work. It, it really isn't that simple, unfortunately. You kind of need to go through the full design. And at that point, you'll understand which one governs. And you it, you will learn that through experience. So the more you design and the more times you go through this process and not just the, the what I've been through, but thinking about the detailing and how it all goes together, 
the better, which is really an advert for a later session where we go through connection design and how we think about detailing all of this stuff to make sure that it works really, really well. And that, I believe, is my 40th minute, give or take. That's fantastic, James. You um, always do get it bang on and uh, not too many, not too many mistakes. Not too many. I mean, except for the day of the year or whatever. That's not that's nice. So, uh, you know, that, that's the thing. So we've got any questions. So, um, Vicky, I don't, are you able to join us? Um, and while Vicky's sort of turning everything back on again, I just want to say thank you to Woodland Heritage. I'm uh, at a sawmill in Whitney on Wye, and they're letting me use their office. So uh, there's plenty of timber columns that they could do to C16 outside or possibly C24 of its Douglas um, fur. But there is um, a question. Um, or there's actually some answers um, or some yeah, suggestions. Great. Vicky. Crowdsource the solution. Mm -hmm. Uh, don't know if you can see it so Reese has said g underscore o for fifth percentile is in the table 3.16 of the i struct timber manual but then he's also come back and says apologies this is for lvl i don't know if you yeah. um just on the point before please can you share accounts as a pdf uh I'm not sure, Tabitha, what, what the plan is. The video will be available. But, mm. but just in case you're not aware, uh, in in designing uh, timber structures, which I've put in front of the wrong camera, there we go, in this, this, it actually includes a number of detailed counts, which go through everything in way more detail and way more, uh, a way more well-considered approach than I did this. These counts are by my 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 friend Andrew Thompson, who is fantastic, and they include like a, a full written commentary that goes through the whole thing. It includes things like not just uh, the design, but how to calculate the loading, the wind load, all of that stuff. So, the uh, you know, there, there's some good information out there that you can hopefully utilize. Yeah, thanks, thanks for that, James. Um, somebody also questions put in there, Luca. Um, there's an also a useful blog from Napier about the fifth percentile shear modulus. But um, we're we we you must have explained things so well. We're very very light on questions. Yeah, or, or so badly that no one knows where to start. I don't know. We got Demetrius and Ian are both laughing. Oh, here I go. So right. Demetrius is one of my students. So. Um... Ah, he knows you well. Yeah, he's well. A question, fantastic. You know, it's good. It's lovely when, you know, you, you lecture some students or you actually teach some students and they, they keep following you. You know, you know you've done a good job. It must be really heartwarming. Martin yeah. has said, can plasterboard be counted as the sheathing or does it have to be ply? Uh, that's a great question. I, I should know the answer, but it's been a little while since I've done stud wall design. Uh, maybe Vicky, Vicky knows. Does it need to be double skinned and well nailed? Yeah, and there are different rules. Generally, I think when I've approached it, I've used it doesn't have to be ply, but something like OSB on at least one side is it, kind of robust. Um, and if it is plasterboard, then it's, it's got to be there are different grades of plasterboard. So you've got to look carefully at the right, get the right grade and also look at, as Vicky said, make sure it's fixed in the right way. So I think it's probably a, a it can be, but answer it's not as simple as yeah just use all plasterboard and it'll be fine you, you need to dig through the details but it is covered in the code uh, this stuff is all kind of summarized so you can work out in fact probably someone else on the call already knows the answer i'm not sure yeah as you like the crowdsourcing answers so yeah anybody else want to jump in and and uh, add to, to james and vicky then 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 please do um <laughs> Right, somebody here just doesn't even want to do it by hand. So Brett says, it feels like there should be a mass CAD program where you can input the data and get output with a caveat of connections. Yeah, absolutely. That That is easy to do. My, um, my only reticence with that kind of thing, and I'm just really old, and this makes me sound like a dinosaur, is you disconnect people from the the kind of the what's going on and that that sense of is this right or right is this wrong you know that ability to self-check your answers um so i would it's absolutely fine i used to do lots of automated counts but i only am happy to use them once i've been through the process enough that i'm confident that i can do it first 
but before automating rather than going straight to an automated account without actually knowing what are the key things, what are the key uh, decisions you need to make, what are the key assumptions you need to make, which things actually have a big impact versus a small impact, all of that sort of thing. Uh, right, where are we going with this? Uh, so um, somebody's saying come back, which I think is a student saying perhaps TEDS. I have heard of TEDS. Yeah, that's the um, cloud package I used to use. Yeah. And um, someone's asked about service holes in the columns. I mean, I would really try and avoid big holes. Um, I think you can put small holes through stud work, um, uh, but I would be aiming for the center, not at the edges where the stress is lowest. Um, but there's probably some standard trader guidance or other other organizational guidance on on what you can and can't include um often with 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 some forms of construction you you have your your stud work but you then have rails uh on on the stud work which enable you to put a lot of services behind the plasterboard as well so rather than trying to feed everything through it gets quite fiddly there are other ways uh, of, of constructing walls which actually make it a lot easier to install services in the thickness of the wall yeah. well they tend to be called service service voids um they uh so we have a question from artem who's got his hands up and wants to ask it live um Great. and then artem are you i uh, will just ask you yep. that was uh just a question of clarifying on the plasterboard can you hear me okay yeah yes of whether the plasterboard needs to be on both faces or whether it's okay to be putting the sheathing well attached to just one face of the stud wall. I yes, know. I think OSB imply on one face is adequate and then uh, uh, any kind of plaster on the other is, is normally enough uh, in, in my experience. But uh, again, you probably find it's written down. And so we have Kitty joining us as well. She thinks it should be ply or OSB as a primary board and the plaster board contributions can be calculated for secondary contributions. Yeah, yeah. I knew but, Kitty know the answer. Yeah. But other types of boards which serve as a sheathing function as well as properties provided by plaster boards. Um, as somebody was asking about, is there anything more breathable than, than, than ply? Um, it's a great question. I'm terrible on breathability. I don't know. Vicky, if you know more about breathability of different materials. I'm going to say that I don't. So, so, Sorry. so again, yeah. Well, again, this is you know where where our professional sort of lives overlap or don't overlap, and it's yeah the cultures. Where, where how far do you go in the whole construction, which is very very complex. Yeah. Um, Keith, Keith, nice to hear from you. So, I think you're from Buckland Timber. Um, or oh, actually, sorry, I am mixing you up completely with somebody else. Um, so just mentioning again, there's been a few problems with younger any engineers using software, uh, which has been incorrect. And therefore, if you don't have the experience to actually do it longhand, you won't realise that you've actually got the calculation wrong. Yeah, I mean, I, I, the only thing I'd add is I'm sure old engineers have also had that problem. I don't think it's an age related thing. It's a it's an experience of using that particular material related thing, I think. So having that good experience first and then transitioning to rapid calculation methods where you have that ability to sense check the answer and say, does this feel right is, is really helpful. If if uh if you don't have that experience and you 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 can use things like the scheme design books just to double check that the sizes look and feel right as well so i wouldn't use them for detailed design but as a as a kind of a backup a, a sense check of the design scheme design books can be helpful for that too and lots of comments coming in about you know plasterboards and sheathing so we'll let you know everybody sort of carry on and read those up um but a uh, question from louise whoops everything's moving are there limitations on achieving moment connections in columns Yes, uh, it, it, the answer is long and complicated and um, there's going to be a session on connections later. The, the, I mean, it, it, uh, moment connections are complicated in timber because timber connections tend to be less rigid than steel connections. So they, they, there is a degree of movement in them. So there's all sorts of complications and you know things to think about when you do moment connections. Can you put moment connections into columns? Absolutely, yes. Do they require a lot of thought and and and, and design? Uh, absolutely, yes, as well. So it's not that you can't have moment co connections in columns. They're just 
they're, they're, they require a very specific process and design and, and thinking through not just the strength as i said it's it, it can be the stiffness as well we kind of just assume everything's fully fixed if you're used to steel and concrete design those connections are going to act uh, as semi-rigid connections so in terms of things like movement you you need to be aware of the fact that they're not fully fixed and there will be some flexibility in the connection when you're checking things like sway stiffness Brilliant. Thank you, James. Um, somebody just put some links in to the books you mentioned into the chat. I'm just going to post a link from Timber Development UK on the new C16 and C24 span tables available to download. And we're working on a completely new knowledge library that should come live in the next few months. So no more questions in the chat. Any final words, Vicky or James, before I go back to sharing my screen? No, not particularly. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining. We really appreciate it. Um, we hope you get excited about designing things out of timber. We we really are excited about designing things out of timber. Do come along to the rest of the sessions. I think they will. I've seen the speaker line out. It's fantastic. I think they're going to be really, really good. And um, yeah, do if you want to connect with me on LinkedIn and find out what we're up to, what I'm up to, then do. And I'm sure Vicky, Vicky has similar things. Yeah, you 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 summed that up really well. James, so I will uh, just encourage everybody to come to the next session. Yeah, so with that, a huge thank you both James and Vicky for sharing your knowledge and giving your time to join us. And yes, you know, LinkedIn is a fantastic place for actually connecting with people and asking questions. Um, timber engineering resources so we do have some online so um, on the Timber Development UK website. Um, we also run a student challenge, so any of you who are working with students, our next challenge will be around af sustainable, affordable housing from timber. So whether you're going to have timber columns in there, you will now know how to do the calculations for them. So that was a lovely link. We go through to designing timber connections, as James just met. Um, mentioned um, next week and we'll be joined by Andrew Livingston from Edinburgh Napier University and Sophie Frith from Structure Workshop. So with that I'd like just to say a huge thank you. Um, it, it is recorded, it will be live on our web channel very very shortly. Um, come and find us there and my plea to you it all is yes please design in timber where it's appropriate but please design so that the timber lasts longer in use than it took to grow. And having been out in a forest today, the growing of those seeds, turning them into timber, it can take anything from 40 to 100 plus years. So the more you start understanding about that, the um, the more appropriate we, we can use timber. But a huge thank you and hope to see you all again next week. Take care. Thanks, guys. Take care.